كل المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فكقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثروا فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك رب المرصاد فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات Most of our age, Imam Zamana, our respected elders and brothers, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allow me to take this opportunity to extend my own condolences and your condolences to the awaited Savior of our time, Imam al Hajj Ajalullahu ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. For tonight is certainly one of the most grievous of nights for us in our entire calendar and the martyrdom of this great human being, this master of an individual, this warrior of all warriors is someone whom we can turn to tonight insha'Allah for all of our needs and for whatever the situation we have, whatever need we are in tonight insha'Allah we ask by the wasila of Abu Fadl Abbas ibn Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahu salamu alayhi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Our discussions so far have led us to the point in which we have seen the various tyrannical groups and ideologies that are presented within Surah Al-Fajr. We found that the first group is the group of Aad and that particularly their group were people who were willing to consider that they were more powerful than any other and therefore this was the problem of their own attitude towards everything else. And the second was the group of Thamud in the fact that they were not only inheriting this poor attitude but were willing to actually go a step further in their actions and actually kill a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then 
yesterday we looked at Fir'aun and we mentioned that Fir'aun was someone who not only was willing to perform such actions of denial and actions of killing but he was someone who went a step further and denied the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and considered himself to be the grand lord and by virtue of this level of audacity by this level of rejection he had taken his own system to another level where he had created his own pharaonic system and thereby any pharaoh today wherever they may be in whichever country that they may be residing in their pharaonic system is akin to the very pharaonic system mentioned within the holy quran and ultimately all three of those individual groups and their leaders their ideologies their actions can be seen manifested in Yazid bin Muawiyah, the greatest Fir'aun to have ever stepped foot within this earth. And therefore now having concluded that, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now tells us that there is a particular punishment for these particular groups. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the following verses, فَصَبَّ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّكَ صَوْتَ عَذَابِ Now this verse in itself is very interesting by virtue of a grammatical understanding. We won't dwell too long on it, inshallah. We want to move to a uh, subsequent verse. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabba alayhim, that this is uh, a punishment that is poured down upon them. And it's interesting that this word sabba is used and being poured down because when someone begins to try to visualize the idea of pouring something down, we see that it might be akin to you taking a glass and pouring and you will see that this is a heavy flow that even though the water itself may start and leave the cup there is still more water to follow from the first drop and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that his punishment was this that it was poured down upon these three particular groups and then at the end of this verse he says sawta adab Salt has an interesting root word which is salt. Some of the translations, some of the translators have given us the word salt to mean the tip of a whip. The tip of a whip. Now you know when a whip is struck, that of course a large proportion of the whip may strike. It might be, for example, a lash across the back. But at the same time, it may just be the tip of the whip that is struck against that which it is hitting. The word sut is the name of the tip of the whip. And therefore the translations say that when this adab is poured down, it was sawta adab, that it was the tip of that adab that was sent down upon them. It was almost as if this punishment that we have observed and seen with Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun, those punishments were the tip of the iceberg. It was the tip of the whip that struck down upon these three tyrannical groups. It wasn't even the entire punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the entire punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may just be waiting in the next world when they have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And therefore that verse is a very authoritative verse, not only in regards to the punishment that may be seen, but also in regards to our knowledge and certainty that whatever has been dealt to Yazid bin Muawiyah in this world is only a very small proportion of what he will get in the next life, inshallah. And thus we conclude that verse and we now move to a sequence of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the issue slightly. So firstly, if we go back into the first series of verses, we mention that there are various qasam, various oaths taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these oaths are akin to the movement of the master of the martyrs. And then we moved into the three tyrannical regimes that are presented. And then we get to an interesting series of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks on an issue in regards to how mankind react to either blessings or the trials and tribulation that are sent down upon them. Now here we can start off by saying that these verses have very much an issue in regards to the psychological outlook of a human being. We mentioned in a previous night that Qur'an has to have every discussion. For it to be a universal book, for it to speak to all ages, genders, realities, ways of 
uh, mind, any person at any time in any point in history, it needs to be able to speak to you and I at all levels. Similarly, it also must have every single discussion, a principle of every single discussion within it. Now, one may ask about what kind of discussions are entered within the Qur'an. These sets of verses are part and parcel of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks on issues in regards to psychology. Many of us take psychology at uh, university. Many of us study psychology when we want to understand how the mind works and also how to react to certain situations as well. These verses within Surah Al-Fajr are part of that issue in regards to the psychological outlook of a human being. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْلَمُهُ وَنَعَّمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا And then the verse is almost identical. It's almost identical but changes slightly. It says, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا He states two verses as to how mankind is treated and how mankind reacts towards these situations. As for man, When his Lord tries him, then treats him with honor and makes him lead an easy life, he says, my Lord has honored me. But when he tries him and straightens him to means of subsistence in difficulty, he says, my Lord has disgraced me. Here we have two potentials and we have two outlooks. We have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give blessings to someone and the outlook based upon that might be a human being will say, my Lord has honored me by virtue of giving me these blessings. And a second is where he will test him, he will straighten his subsistence, his risk. فَقَدَرَ alayhi. He will become squeezed within that risk. And the response may be, that my Lord specifically, Rabbi Ahanan, that he has disgraced me. Now here we find that these verses are very interesting because all of us have a constant cycle of gaining and losing worldly blessings. There isn't anyone here at any age that is not accustomed to going through trials and tribulations. We have those trials and tribulations in many facets of our life. We go through them in terms of our health, We go through them in terms of our wealth. We go through them in terms of uh, the the structure within our family and the ease and the difficulties. Many times things are coming. And in fact, many of this doesn't even take place in front of the eyes of other people. You and I will only know the levels of trials and tribulations that we go in within our own family members that are closed behind doors. The outside world doesn't have a clue as to the trials that you and I go through. And maybe they will never know as to the difficulties that you and I go through in our own private lives. And therefore, straight away at all levels, these verses are very much inclined to you and I. We see that we go through these trials and tribulations, and therefore straight away, we can already see how you and I react to those situations. Am I the kind of person who responds by saying, my Lord has honored me? Am I the kind of person who says, my Lord has disgraced me? Am I the kind of person who says, why my Lord, why me? I'm a good person, you know, I come to the mosque, I pray five times a day, you know, I give charity, why me? Why did I have to go through these trials and tribulations? There are some that react like this, and then there are others who react in different ways. The most beautiful example of a human being reacting in a positive manner when trials and tribulations bestowed all around them is Sayyidah Zainab, peace be upon her, when she was asked, Allahumma salam. How did you find the tenth of Muharram? How did you find the head of your brother being placed upon a spear? She responds by saying, I saw nothing but beauty within this. Straight away, we know that we have heard this statement hundreds of times in our life. Am I capable of digging deep within myself that when I come across a trial and tribulation, which in the grand scheme of things is probably minor compared to what other people have to go through in the world, am I capable of saying, I saw the beauty of Allah in that incident in my life? Reality strikes home when you compare your own situation to others. 
Am I one who is living in Somalia, who is unable to know where my next meal is going to come from? Nay, at the same time that there are countries bombing that very same country. You don't know if you're going to get food, but at the same time when you go to the market, you don't know if there a bomb is going to go off or a country is going to drop a bomb upon you. Is my situation like that? No, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. What great bounties I still have. And then you compare yourself to others in Pakistan, that they don't have the ability to step outside of their own door for fear of a reprisal based upon their faith and based upon their love for Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. And then I say, what situation am I in compared to another within the human race and the human species? Am I like the one in Mexico, in the city of Guatemala, where the city is so overrun by drug lords that there isn't one single police officer in that entire city? One single police officer, male, female, no one, no one at all. What level of security do they have within that city? And again, then I raise my hand and I say, thank you, my Lord, even though I am trialed, even though there is difficulty in my life, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I see nothing in it but beauty. And that point comes when you understand the sacrifice of Sayyidah Zainab on the 10th of Muharram. Now, when we come into these particular verses, there are two verses, as we stated, and they show us opposing ideologies. But in fact, they show us a number of important levels of depth in regards to our own psychological understanding of trials and tribulations. As for man, when his Lord tries him, then treats him with honor and makes him lead an easy life, he says, my Lord has honored me. But when he tries him differently, then straightens to him his means of subsistence, he says, my Lord has disgraced me. The first thing we see here is that both being blessed with great ni'mat and kirama and being blessed with any trial and tribulation and any squeezing of risk is both a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبَّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ That even to be given in great bounty is still a test. And to be taken away from is also a test. One isn't a greater test over the other. One doesn't mean that Allah loves you more or loves you less. Both of them are a test. That when you are given great risk, and when you are given... Uh, when risk is taken away from you, both of them are a test in the same way. Now here, risk is blessing. It is anything that is given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not just wealth. Risk is your health as well. Risk is everything that your family is still with you. Risk is any blessing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, when I'm given those risks, it is still a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that risk is taken away from me, it is still a test by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at that point we see that when man has been given risk, his statement is, my Lord has honored me. But when it is taken away from him, he says, my Lord has disgraced me. Here the dichotomy is in my measurement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I now place my own perspective on Allah instead of allowing Him to rule my way of thinking. I have the audacity to say that when He has given to me, He has blessed me. But when He has taken away, He has stopped blessing me. As opposed to thinking both of these are blessings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of these are blessings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To take away, in some cases, may be a bigger blessing than to give me. Because when I have, I may be, may be doing wrong by it. But when I don't have in the first place, I cannot do wrong by that risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me. <coughs> so here these are very fundamental thinkings and processes of thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give to us. There is a wonderful tradition that comes to us from the time, the night of Mi'raj, in regards to the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. It's in regards to our outlook and our gratitude for everything that we have and everything that we don't have as well, when we are given and when it is taken away from us. The Holy Prophet of Islam, as we know, many incidents take place on the night of Mi'raj. Wonderful traditions and you can imagine these, all these prophets and angels getting together in heaven 
and they are now showing us prime examples of how the system works behind the veils. So now the Holy Prophet of Islam is ascending. He's ascending through the various heavens and he gets to what we can only describe is a room. He gets into a room and as he enters into this room, Jibreel Amin is beside him and he sees this room is split into two. On one side of the room, there are angels and they are working very, very busily and they don't have a moment's break. I'm paraphrasing to make us understand. They're all these angels, they're working very busy and they don't have a moment's break. There's no stop for them. On the other side of the room, there is another group of angels. The same number, the same volume of angels. But they are working at a slower pace. They're not working so hard. Every few minutes they get up and they do something. Then they sit back down again. Then a few minutes later they stand up and they do something else. Rasulullah turned towards Jibra'il Amin and said, Oh Jibra'il, can you tell us what is this scenario? What is this room that I see in front of me? What is taking place? Jibra'il Amin says that this is the room which coordinates the dua that is given from the mu'mineen towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is specifically the room that deals with how the mu'mineen ask and how they react when they get blessings. So this room is split into two. This side of the room is the angels that when the dua rises from the mu'mineen, it reaches these angels and they are given the responsibility by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dealing with the dua that is made. As you can see, so many du'a come from human beings that constantly they are working. There is not a moment's respite from them and at every moment you see that they are working on behalf of the human beings. O oh, Jibra'il, what is that side of the room? That side of the room is that portion of the room that they receive a thank you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the du'a that has been accepted at that point. So therefore that room, that side of the room is working less slowly. That side of the room only every few minutes may receive an Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see two portions of the room. And therefore the idea is that even during all times I must be grateful to Allah for whatever I have and have not been given. There's an incident that takes place in regards to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari and our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al Baqir, salawatullah salamu alayhi. We have that famous tradition whereby the Holy Prophet of Islam says to Jabir, O oh Jabir, you will see my grandson Muhammad Baqir when you see him, pass him my salams. And this story starts at that point. So Jabir is blind at his age. He is sitting on that pavement and now the fifth Imam walks by him. Jabir says, who are you? I tell by the movement of your footsteps that there are humility in the way in which you walk. Tell me who are you? I am Muhammad al-Baqir, the son of Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. At this point, he says to him, oh my master, you are Muhammad Baqir, I have a message for you from your grandfather, the Holy Prophet of Islam. He passes his greetings and salutations. And you can imagine if you and I received salutations from Rasulullah, how overjoyed we would be. It's no, no different for the fifth Imam. He is still overjoyed at receiving these salutations. The hadith says, he says, O Jabir, my companions are waiting for me at my house. Come with me. Let us walk together so that you may tell them that the, the Prophet has passed me salams. So now they are walking. They are walking side by side. Jabir is blind. He poses a question to him. He says, Ya Jabir, kayfa sabruka? How is your patience? You see, he is very elderly, blind, going through trials and tribulations. Ya Jabir, kayfa sabruka? How is your patience at this moment in time? Jabir responds by saying, O oh, Imam, O oh, my Master Ibn Rasulullah, during times of goodness, I say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. During times of difficulty, I complain to my Lord and ask for an improvement in my situation. Is that not a fair statement from Jabir? During times of ease, I say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. 
But during times of difficulty, I say, my Lord, improve my situation. Do we not do that? Do we not proclaim that same dua, that same statement, my Lord, improve my situation? The response from the fifth Imam, O oh Jabir, that answer does not befit a man like you. SubhanAllah. Jabir is such a huge companion, a grand, possibly one of the greatest companions of all times. He has lived from the time of Rasulullah, 1416 battles with him. He is there as the first Za'ir of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He is the man who has given to us Hadith al Kisa. What knowledge and station Jabir has. Yet the fifth Imam says, O oh Jabir, this response does not befit a man in your station. My master, what should I say? What answer would have been befitting of me? He says at this point, O oh Jabir, when you are in times of ease, say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And when you are in times of difficulty, also say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Look at the outlook from the Imam. Look at his perspective on how trials and tribulations should not affect my psychological output. I should not be defeated. I should not be the one who is broken. I should be the one during all trials and tribulations to stand in the same way that I bow in sajda and ask Allah to improve my situation during times of difficulty should be the same tear of gratitude I cry in sajda when I'm given blessings. At that point, I have reached to the station of where Ahl al-Bayt were in their own station. There is a wonderfully intriguing verse that speaks volumes about this issue. It comes to us from Surah Al-Hadid. In fact, Surah Al-Hadid, for those of us who have heard this masaib and this musibah, on the last moments of the Lady of Light, as her chest is giving way, as the internal bleeding may have been overcoming her. At this point, she gives a wasiyah to her husband, the commander of the faithful. She says, Ya Ali, I give to you a final set of statements from me. Amongst those final statements from the Lady of Light, she says, after my death, read Surah Al-Hadid, for within Surah Al-Hadid, there are remedies in there for you. What a psychological surah this surah must be for you and I. And that whatever trial and tribulation we are going through, we may turn to Surah Al-Hadid in order to gain strength from this. If Sayyidah Zahra, peace be upon her, can recommend this to the commander of the faithful, imagine what you and I can do when we turn towards our Lord in our own trials and tribulations. Surah Al-Hadid has a wonderful verse. It has a series of verses which we may not have time to go into. And these verses start from around verse 21 and last at around verse 27 for your own reading, insha'Allah. In this sequence of verse, it has one which says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لِكَيْ لَا تَعْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَحْفْرَهُ بِمَا آتَاكُمْ لِكَيْ لَا تَعْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَحْفْرَهُ بِمَا آتَاكُمْ You should not be, لِكَيْ لَا تَعْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ You should not become despondent at that which has escaped you and you should not become overjoyed at that which he has given to you now let us just look at this translation the first thing you should not be despondent at that which escapes you and that you should not become overjoyed at that which he gives to you do you see the difference when he says about that which escapes you he does not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily Equate your and my loss to himself But when it comes to blessings being given He equates it to himself Do not become despondent at that which escapes you And do not become overjoyed at that which he has given to you He separates the issue Meaning when I lose blessings Before I complain to my Lord Before I turn to him and ask him to improve my situation Maybe, just maybe I must introspect, look at myself to see whether I am the cause of losing those blessings before saying he is the one who has put me into this trial and tribulation. It's two different things. It's not a problem to turn to him. It's the right and absolute needy thing to do. But as a psychological outlet, as a means to improve myself before stating it is a test, 
before suggesting I blame my Lord and say he is the one for alayhi for the one to maybe squeeze my risk maybe I look to myself and see whether I am the human being that is at fault for that particular loss how many verses of Quran do we see that says indeed by the hand of your own actions is the result of what takes place how many nights on a Thursday each week do I read the verses that state that I seek forgiveness from those particular actions that bring about this blocking of the du'a towards you. Allahumma ghfir li yadhunub allati tahbisud du'a. Allahumma ghfir li yadhunub allati tunzilul. Maybe I am the one by my own action who has caused bala to fall down upon me. Maybe I am the one that needs to introspect to see what issues I were given and then I am the one who rejected. Maybe I was given wealth in abundance. I was not grateful and therefore it has left me. Maybe I was the one who was given health, did not respect my health and that's why tomorrow it has been taken away from me. You see, sometimes we need to look to the sunnah. And this is a very, very fine and delicate point. I, I, I ask for definite attention, especially to my younger brothers and sisters who are in the audience tonight. Understand the sunnah of the Holy Prophet of Islam. We have become to the point that sometimes we see certain narrations about a sunnah and we overlook those small, small sunnah. Just as an example, we get the sunnah that on certain nights of the week we should cut our nails. Just mentioning small, small sunnah that we should begin our meal with a pinch of salt, and so on and so forth. There are certain sunnah that speak about the body and small things that we can do in regards to our own body, that sometimes we need to understand in a medical perspective as well. And if we leave these small, small sunnah, we run the risk of falling into bad health later on in our lives. I'll give you an example. Small, small sunnah that sometimes we forget. We have the tradition that says, do not bite your nails, otherwise you will lose your memory. True? We have heard this. Now, understand it from the Bedouin's perspective. But understand it from the 21st, perspective, 21st century perspective with things like Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you told a Bedouin 1400 years ago about Alzheimer's disease, would he understand it? No. When you tell someone today of the mental diseases and the uh, loss of understanding that can take place at latter ages, do we understand it? We do. We see our own friends and family members going through these debilitating diseases. But if I was told that I am the one who creates this, I would look differently at how these are tests. If I am the one who understands this hadith in a slightly different manner, maybe, just maybe, I will understand the outcome differently. The hadith says, does it not, to take a pinch of salt before your meal and it will remove 70 diseases from the stomach. Does it not? How often we hear this tradition, but yet I do not equate the potential of those 70 diseases to the cancers of the bowel that are available at later ages. And then we fall ill and we say, why my Lord? When my Lord points and says, did my Prophet not give to you the divine sunnah of how to look after your body? The hadith, no hadith, excuse me, there is an incident that takes place. This is one of my favorite traditions about the upkeep of these small, small sunnahs. Small, small sunnahs. Grand scholars got together for a meal. Two of them include Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Qasim al khui May Allah bless his soul. Sayyid Khu'i does not need an introduction for my elders, but for my youth and the ones who only know his name, I will humbly say that we have not had, nor may we ever have, a scholar who is as a giant as Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Qasim al khui Inshallah, that suffices. There has not been, nor will there be, a scholar who is close to Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Qasim al-Khoi. This dinner was taking place at the residence of Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Qasim al-Khoi's house. A group of scholars were invited to partake within this meal. And then one scholar who was sitting in front of him, when they both extended their arms in order to begin the meal, 
this one scholar, Ayatollah Talaqani, refused to begin eating. You can imagine scholars of that level eating, and one, they're sitting on that mat, and one of them refuses to extend his hand to begin eating. Said Khu'i says, can you explain to me, please, why are you not eating? He says there is no salt on the table. The hadith of the Prophet says you must begin with a pinch of salt. And therefore, I cannot begin my meal unless there is salt within the table. Said Khu'i calls one of the servants and says, please go into the kitchen and get some salt for us. Servant goes, comes back, Sayyidi, there is no salt within the house. Ayatollah Tariqani is refusing to eat. It's almost as if his arms are crossed. I'm not eating. I'm not eating. I'm sorry. The sunnah of Rasulullah. I'm not eating. What do you do? <coughs> Imagine you're in that gathering. None of you are going to extend your hand, are you? None of you are going to start the meal because you cannot at that point. Said Khu'i says to him, Sheikh, if you were this attached to the sunnah of Rasulullah, Maybe you should bring some salt with you to the meals Lest it stops the rest of us from eating <laughs> Ayatollah Taliqani responds He opens his jubba He takes out a packet of salt He puts it on the mat and says I always carry with me a packet of salt I just wanted to teach you the importance of following the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I just wanted to teach you the importance of following the sunnah of Rasulullah. Wonderful, wonderful example of how even the min most minute sunnahs are kept. And therefore I have to understand that I am also the cause of the loss of these blessings. Whether it be health, whether it be wealth, whatever the blessing may be, I must introspect at all time and be grateful for that and follow that which is prescribed to you and I. Then we come further into this verse. The verse says that you should not become despondent at that which has escaped you, and you should not become overjoyed at that which has been given to you by him. Just an in-depth analysis of the grammar here and some of the lexical sides of the word. Allah says, Likayla ta'so. Ta'so comes from the word ya'as. Ya'as means despondency. You see, the verse didn't say, don't grieve. Some translations say, don't grieve at that which has escaped you. That's a poor translation. It doesn't mean don't grieve. Indeed, grieve. Grieving is part of the psychological process. Did Sayyida Zainab alayha, not grieve when she lost her family members? She grieved. Grieved, indeed. Therefore, it is not don't grieve. Yas means despondency. What does despondency mean? It means to lose hope. It means to shrink within the self Rather than standing up and saying I am that human being Which is cradled by the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And therefore I put my entire situation in his stead I close myself and I become quiet I become the one who is no longer confident in the blessings of Allah Lifting me back up towards that point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the opening verses of uh, Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number th 33 of Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَفَوِّذُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا Entrust your affair to Allah For He is وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا He is sufficient as a protector for you and I So therefore if I understand this I will not become despondent I will not become the one who loses hope Ah, my wealth is gone my health is gone. There is no way for me to come out of this situation. The trial is too big for me. Rather, you will do the opposite of despondency. You will stand before your Lord and say to him, My Lord, I entrust you with my situation to get me out of whatever problem I am facing. لِكَيْلَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ Do not become overjoyed at that which he has given to you. Now, تَفْرَحُوا comes from the root word of ifrah. Ifrah has a number of beautiful deep meanings. It means joy, it means happiness. But the context of this one is joy for dunya. Joy for dunya. 
Now, as a mufassir, which we're all becoming, inshallah, at the end of these uh, uh, discussions, uh, the mufassir will, of course, firstly look to Quran to explain another verse. Remember, we said, Allama Tabatabai, Ayatollah Sadiq Tahrani, Marhum, may Allah bless them both. Their style of tafsir was to first explain a verse by another verse, or explain a word by another word based within Quran. So, this word of ifrah or tafrah, where does it come within the Holy Quran? Where does it show us that this is based within dunya, joy, and not joy for akhirah? In the incident in Surah Al-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us uh, the incident of Bilqis. And Bilqis, she now receives that letter from Sulaiman, and that letter says, Bismillah rahman rahim As a response, what does she do? She says to her advisors, O chiefs, tell me what I should do. They suggest that maybe you should send something to him. And when she sends these beauties and these treasures to him, the response from the great prophet is, Bal antum bihadiyatikum tafrahun. It's exactly the same word that is used. Bal antum bihadiyatikum tafrahun. Do you think that I will become overjoyed by this gift of dunya? What Allah has given to me is greater than whatever you can give to me. And therefore this ifrah is only based within the joys of this world. So therefore do not become overjoyed. Become happy. Become happy at what he has been given to what he has given to you. But do not become so overjoyed that you lose your understanding of that which he has given to you. You see here people confuse dunya. We say world. We translate dunya as world. Dunya does not mean world. Dunya is a loose translation. Dunya does not mean world. Dunya, the root word of dunya is ad dani Dani is translated as that which is low or lower. Meaning it is that world that you choose which is lower as opposed to the higher world. When you choose the lower world over the higher world, that is dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very beautifully in Surah Al-A'la that وَآخِرَةُ خَيْرُ وَأَبَقَى That surely that akhirah is that place that we want to be. It is the better place for you and I. So therefore when someone says dunya, when someone says you're going towards dunya, it doesn't mean you're going towards the world. It doesn't mean that you have a nice car and it's a problem. I'm not saying it is a problem. I'm saying that someone says. It doesn't mean that because you have a nice house, that's a problem. No, it doesn't mean that. It means when you consider that nice car to be a means of arrogance, that's dunya for that car. That's dunya. So that car or that house or that job or that holiday, when that becomes a means of pride and arrogance, that's dunya. So dunya is that low choosing of the world. Once, Jabir was sitting with our fifth imam. We love our Jabir stories. Jabir was sitting with our fifth imam. Jabir lets out a huge sigh of disappointment. Ah. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come home after a long day, maybe you've thrown the briefcase down and just said, ah, put the chai on, you know, put the kettle on, I need three sugars tonight, you know? <laughs> this is that deep sigh that Jabir let out. Ah. The fifth imam turned to him. And remember, we qualified how high a scholar Jabir was a minute ago. He turns towards Jabir and says, Oh Jabir, why are you giving this huge sigh in that manner? Fifth imam gets the reply. He says to him, You know, this world, I was sighing over dunya. I was sighing over this world that I'm placed within. The fifth imam responds and says, Oh Jabir, this world is based, the dunya, the low world, is based within seven things. Shall I tell you what those seven things are? He says, Yes, my master, tell me what those seven things are. The world, the low ebb of this world, the people who have concern for the low side of this world, they are qualified within seven things. Those seven things are that which you eat, that which you drink, that which you smell, that which you wear, that which you ride, that which you hear, and that which you marry. Fifty months hadith, not mine. 
I'll get in trouble tonight, I can tell. Those seven things, those are the things that make up this low world. Now, I'll contextualize marriage in a minute, believe me. He says, those seven things are the things which are based within the low side of the world. Shall I explain to you why they are deemed in the low side of the world? And it says things like eating and drinking, the necessities of life. Shall I explain to you why? He says, yes, go ahead. Tell me, my imam. He said, the reason for this world, the, you know, the greatest thing that you can eat in this world, the sweetest thing that you can eat in this world is honey. And honey comes from an insect. Why then do you value it so highly, O Jabir? And he says, O Jabir, that thing which is sweetest for you to drink is cold water. And where you reside, there is an abundance of water. Why are you so concerned with that which you drink? He says, O Jabir, the best clothes that you can wear is silk. And that comes from the behind of a worm. Why are you so concerned with those things that you wear? He says, O Jabir, the very best thing that you can ride is a great steed. And even that steed will end up dying. Why are you so concerned with that steed that you are going to ride upon? He says, O Jabir, the very best thing that you can listen to is music. It is that sweetness that will cause you to fall. Why are you so concerned with being drawn towards haram music? He says, the very best thing that you can marry is your wife. And even that person will give you trials and you will give her trials. Why are you so concerned? Rise above. Yes, now you contextualize it. Rise above. <laughs> Rise above just the petty trials in regards to this life. Those are the low sides of the world. Rise above these small, small things. Go towards the higher side of life. You see here, when you begin to see these sorts of traditions, you begin to contextualize. Jabir responds by saying, from that point on in my life, I was never concerned with an iota of dunya. I was concerned with what I ate. I was concerned with what I married. But I wasn't concerned for the low side of things. I looked at all those things in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the difference. That was the difference. And that's how I understood the trials of this life. Whether I became hungry or thirsty, or whether I lost wealth, or whether I lost my health, or my partner, all of it was contextualized by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we lose, and when we are given, our standing should be the same. The intensity of that sajda shukr in which when I am given something should be the same in with when something is taken. That cry that I make to Allah in dua on the night of Qadr, whether I'm in a state of ease or whether I'm in a state of difficulty, should be exactly the same. That dua for my friends and my family should be exactly the same, whether they are going through difficulty or whether they are going through ease. I should want those blessings to stay and increase. And therefore my tear that I shed for them should be the same as when I see them going through trials and tribulations. When I understand that, when I contextualize how I approach my Lord, the creator and sustainer of all of this, at that point, at that point will I understand how my outlook, my perspective on everything should be, that my sajda should be the same. My salah should be the same in, if in difficulty and in ease. Allah says in those great verses that at that point you see man, he will become the one who blames Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us from becoming the individual that looks upon Allah as the one who has taken away my blessings as opposed to the one that says Allah is the one who gave them to me in the first place. When we are in need, and indeed we are always in need, and at this point, on a 10-second side note, when we seek wasila, please, brothers and sisters, do not just consider wasila and intercession based upon the worldly needs. As hard as you knock at the door of Abu Fadl Abbas to gain worldly blessings, knock at his door to improve your spirituality. Is he not the one who is Abu Fadl? Is he not the one who is the father of all the graces of Allah? 
Therefore, when I say to him, O oh, grand human being who is given that station of Allah as being Bab al Hawaij, tonight I cry to you and I say, Intercede on my behalf. I am the one who is in need to improve my health, but at the same time, I am the one who cannot stand in the morning for Fajr Salah. Improve me, O oh, Abu Fadl Abbas. I am the one who cannot stop looking at this individual at school, or I am the one who cannot stop looking at this individual at work. Grant me that opportunity by your blessings to turn my face away. Whatever spiritual weakness I have, knock at the door of Abu Fadl Abbas. Wallah, tonight, inshallah, you will see that he is the hand that cradles us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go on ziyarat to Abu Fadl Abbas, there is often a narration, an incident that is told for you and I to understand <coughs> this human being. This grand man that we are going to shed an abundance of tears over in a few minutes. You have all, inshallah, been to Karbala, and may Allah take us this year and every year, and all of our children and children's children. When you get to Karbala, you get to that point where you see the grand dome of Abu Fadl Abbas. There is a narration in the story that says one day, a husband and wife, a mother and father, came with their very young child. This child was at the point of death. This young child, innocent babe, was at the point of death. The illness was overcoming him. And they had taken an intention that they would present that child to Babu al-Hawa'ij and say that we are not leaving the precinct of your haram until you grant intercession on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this child. And so day after day, night after night, they sat, that child was in front of the grave, and they would not leave. The alim who would lead the salah in the haram of the master, Abu Fadl Abbas, one night went to sleep, and he saw in his dream three personalities all sitting on thrones of nur. One of them was Rasulullah, another of them was Amir al-Mu'mineen, and the third of them was Abu Fadl Abbas. The alim says, I saw these three grand personalities in conversation with each other. And when they were conversing with each other, I heard what they were saying. That at this point, Abu Fadl Abbas had turned to Amir al-Mu'mineen, and Amir al-Mu'mineen had turned to Rasulullah, Rasulullah had turned towards Jibra'il Amin and asked for the intercession of this young babe. Jibra'il Amin ascended to Allah. Allah gave the response. Jibra'il returned, gave the response to Rasulullah. And Rasulullah said, I am sorry that this child's life has been decreed. The ending of this child's life is upon him. He shall not be given intercession. Abu Fala Abbas became disappointed. He said, please, O oh my father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, ask again, ask again. They have come to me, Babu al-Hawaj. I ask you to ask again. So again, up that ladder, up that chain, that request went to Amir al-Mu'mineen, went to Rasulullah, went to Jibra'il Amin, went to Allah. Allah responded, again, back down the chain, the response came. I am sorry. I have decreed that this child's life is over. There is no more time for him. When Abu Fadl Abbas in the dream heard this response from Allah, he responds. He says, if that is the case, then I want Allah to rid me of this title of being Bab al Hawaij. If I do not have the authority and the power to grant response to the hajat of the mu'mineen, I do not want this title anymore. Take it away from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having heard this response from Abu Fadl Abbas in this dream, immediately responds and says, Oh Abbas, I am the one who has given you that title based upon your sacrifice of Hussein ibn Ali. None shall take that title away from you. That title is decreed from you. I will grant a full life towards that child. And therefore that child will stand up and leave with his parents. The alim woke up. And he went towards the haram. And he looks for that young babe. And that young babe is no longer there. Fearing that this babe has been... Now his life has been taken. He asks, where are the parents? 
He is told, did you not know the parents have left with the child? The child has been granted a miraculous medical outcome. There is no problem with the child. And indeed, the parents and the child have now left. At that point, the alim realized, Babul Hawaij, Abu Fadl Abbas has been granted that title by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, he will always remain as Babul Hawaij. We knock at his door tonight with these tears that we shall shed. We knock at your door, O Abu Fadr Abbas. Salutations be upon you. Assalamu alayka. Peace be upon you. Assalamu alayka. Ya waritha amir al mu'mineen. We send salutations upon you tonight. Peace and blessings be upon you, the one who tried so valiantly to bring that mushk of water to Bibi Sakina. Peace and blessings be upon you, O great man who brought that mushk in the hope to give some water to Ali in Al-Azghar. We say to you, O Wafadl Abbas, that whatever we are going through tonight with these tears, grant us that intercession. Abu Fadl Abbas, he comes towards his master Hussein and says, Oh Hussein, allow me to enter into the battlefield. He is not given that permission. The thirst is overcoming the children. The thirst is defeating them. It is killing them. Sakina walks into that tent in which all the flasks are kept. She picks up that one flask she opens it up and she turns it upside down towards her blessed tongue and lips. Not a single drop of water drops into that young girl's mouth. She brings that mush, hoping for some coolness and puts it towards her cheek and still there is no water to be able to cool her down. She cries out, Al-Atash, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. The thirst is killing me. The thirst is killing me. Oh, Sakina, imagine what Muhammad Baqir was going through as well. Imagine what Ali in al was going through as well. Oh, princess, when you called out Al-Atash, you called out because Ali Azgar was not able to call out Al-Atash, Al-Atash. At this point, the cries of the children is too much for Abu Fadl al-Abbas. He breaks down into tears and he comes towards his master, Hussein. Oh, Hussein, I ask you, please, allow me to go and get water for Sakina. Maybe, just maybe, in this way, maybe with this request, you will allow me to enter in towards the battlefield. There is an answer given in the hadith. Hussein ibn Ali looks his dear brother in the eye and says, Oh Abbas, how can, I, how can I allow you to enter the battlefield? For if you enter the battlefield and you pass away, when you perish, where will my army be at this point in time without you, O oh Abbas? Abbas responds back, Oh my master Hussein, which army do you speak of? Which army do you speak of? There is no one left but you and I, Oh my master Hussein. Akbar has been slaughtered. Qasim has been slaughtered. Own and Muhammad have been slaughtered. It is just you and I. Allow me to enter in towards that battlefield. Hussein ibn Ali allows him to enter into that battlefield field at this point in time and like that brave warrior he enters what does he have with him Abbas has with him he has with him a spear he has with him the alam and he has with him that mushk he enters into the battlefield one narration tells us that he dispatches 850 of the enemies he is the man other than Abu Abdullah to strike the most of the enemies towards the hellfire oh Abbas what warrior you must have been 
we know the story very well that Abbas is such a grand, tall individual that when he rode upon that steed, his legs and his feet dragged upon the ground. We find a narration that says that when Sayyid Mahdi Bahlul when he went towards that haram, when that man went towards the haram in order to fix the haram, he came to his master and said, Oh Master Fadl Bahlul Aloom, can you please tell me why is the grave of Abu Fadl Abbas so small? I hear in the narrations that he was such a tall individual. Why is his grave so small? He begins to weep upon the grave. He says the reason being is because when they cut Abbas, when he fell towards the floor, it was not Abbas that fell towards the floor. It was the pieces of Abbas that was cut. It was the pieces of Abbas that descended towards the plains of Karbala. Hussein sees his brother enter into the battlefield. There is a story I want you to understand. All those of you who are brothers, all of you who are brothers, I want you to take this story and understand this story. There is a narration that says that in Qum, there was an alim that decided to tell his students of an a'mal that could be performed in order to see the event of Karbala. To see the event of Karbala. This student went and took this a'mal and recited this a'mal and by virtue of this he began to see the event of Karbala. One day passed. The second day passed. The third day passed. The student did not return back towards the meeting. He did not return back towards the lesson of the teacher. The other students were very concerned that the student had not returned back. So they looked for him, they could not find him. Eventually they broke into the apartment, the house of this student, and they found this student. He was lying on the floor shaking, shaking and shaking and shaking. They came towards him and they revived him. They said, tell us, O student, tell us, what did you see that has put you into this state? Did you see the beheading of Abba Abdullah? Did you see when Zainab was struck by the whip? Did you see when Sukaina's earrings were snatched from her? What did you see to put you into this state where you are shaking for three days? The student responds back, By Allah, I was granted one vision of the day of Ashura. All I saw was the final embrace between these two brothers. All I saw was the final embrace when Hussein said to Abbas, Enter in towards the battlefield. At this point, Hussein sees Abbas enter into the battlefield. He rides like that warrior that he is. And he strikes down the enemies. He comes towards the river Furat. He descends and he picks up that cold water. And then he raises it towards himself. But he remembers the statement of his father. He remembers the statement of his father. Oh Abbas, when you reach the bank of the river Euphrates, do not have that water. For that water is for Hussein and his children. At that point he throws the water back within the river he brings the mushk and he puts the water into that mushk and he rides back towards the camp I ask you oh brothers and sisters tell me what Sakina must have been seeing at that moment in time was she not standing outside the tents watching Abbas go was she not looking at the alam head towards the river Furat imagine when the alam returns from the river Furat, how much joy this young girl must have had. She must have thought to my herself, my uncle Abbas is coming with the water. I can't say that the hadith has said this, but I imagine that her, as the leader of the children, she must have gone to Muhammad Baqir, she must have gone towards Fatima to Sughra and said, oh children of Ahlul Bayt, my uncle Abbas promised us water. I see his alam returning. He is coming back with that mushk of water. Come out. Come and greet Abu Fadl Abbas for he is about to return. 
but Abbas would never return. Abbas would not return back towards the camp. At this point, the enemies begin to shower him with everything that they have. One man hides behind the tree. As this man hides behind the tree, he raises his sword. He sees Abu Fadl al-Abbas riding towards the camp. They are shouting, do not let that water reach the camp of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. This man, he rises his sword. He strikes it down upon the right arm of Abu Fadl al Abbas. Abbas, he loses his arm from the right elbow. It falls towards the ground. Abbas, he passes the mushk towards his left hand as a warrior would do. His only concern is the thirst of little Sakina. At this point, another man comes from the left hand side. He strikes the arm of Abu Fadl al Abbas. The arm falls towards the floor. He puts the mushk in his mouth. At this point, the enemies call out, Strike him with everything that you have. Strike him with your swords. Strike him with your spears. Shower him with a row of arrows. Whatever has to be done to stop that mush from reaching the children of Hussein. At this point, Abu Fadl Abbas, he is riding back towards the camp. <laughs> They begin to strike him with arrows. One arrow embeds itself into the chest of Abu Fadl Abbas. One arrow strikes the eye of Abu Fadl Abbas. At this point, he still does not waver. The great warrior is reaching and going towards Hussein's tent. But then one enemy of Allah, he swings a mace. I ask you, O oh brothers and sisters, how many spikes does a mace have? Oh brothers and sisters, how can a mace be embedded into the head of Abu Fadl Abbas? Even with those arrows, he still runs and won his horse towards them. At that point, a man lifts the mace, he swings that mace, and he thrusts it into the forehead of Abu Fadl Abbas. Only at that point does Abbas fall towards the floor. But the torture of Abbas does not stop there. They strike him with his sword. They begin to cut him into pieces. He calls out for his brother As-salamu alayka ya Abba Abdillah Oh Abba Abdillah come to the aid of your brother come to me. At this point Hussein cries out, ah my back has been broken Abbas how can I go on now that you are going to be taken taken from me. Hussein falls towards the floor. He gets back up and he rises towards Zuljanah. He says, Zuljanah, take me towards Abbas. Zuljanah rides out in towards the battlefield. At that point, Zuljanah stops. Oh, Zuljanah, have you taken me to the body of Abbas? Zuljanah looks down. What does Hussein see? He sees one of the arms of Abbas on the floor. He continues to go. Zuljana stops again. Oh Zuljana, have you brought me to the body of Abbas? Zuljana looks down again. What does he see? He sees the mask. He sees that flask which was supposed to be quenching the thirst of Sakina on the floor. Hussein continues to go forward. Eventually, eventually he comes to the broken body of Abu Fadl Abbas. This is the saddest narration one can imagine. He comes and he steps towards Abbas. Abbas is blinded by the blood in his eye. And the other eye is pierced by an arrow. Hussein sits down by his blessed brother. He picks up the head of Abbas and puts it into his lap. Do you know what Abbas does? Abbas moves his head away from the lap of Hussein. He picks the head up again and he puts it into 
into the lap. Again, he moves the head. Again, Hussein lifts the head and puts it into his lap. At this point, Abbas cries out, Oh man, please do not cut my head off just yet. Give me a few minutes respite. I am awaiting my brother. I want to perform the ziyarat of my brother for one final time. Do not strike my head off yet. Hussein responds, Oh Abbas, it is your brother Hussein. My master, I am sorry. I could not see you. I cannot see you with this arrow embedded into my eye. I cannot see you with this blood. Hussein wipes the blood from the eye of Abu Fadl Abbas. He wipes it and he says, Peace be upon you, my dear brother. Peace be upon you, my dear master. For I finally get to see you at this point in time. At this point, they begin to discuss, they begin to engage with each other. At this point, he says to him, let me take your body back towards the tents. Let me take your body back towards the tents. Abbas says, oh my dear master Hussein, I cannot bear to be taken back towards the tents. I feel shy. I feel shy. Who do you feel shy in front of, my dear brother? I feel shy in front of Sakina because I could not fulfill her request of bringing water and I feel shy in front of Zaina because I know that if she sees my body in these pieces she will not be able to take what has happened to me she will not be able to stand what has happened to me leave my body at this point please leave at this point Hussein makes his own request he says says, oh my dear brother Abbas, all your life you have called me master. I ask you to call me brother for one final time. He responds, Baya, oh my dear brother, oh my dear brother. And with those final breaths, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. The final breaths of Abu Fadl Abbas are taken. There is a narration that says that when this was being described, when this tragedy was being described, an alim saw in a dream, the dream of Sayyidah Zahra coming towards her, going towards him. Zahra comes towards this alim and says, you have recited the tragedy of my son Abbas. You recited, but you did not recite the greatest tragedy to fall upon Abbas. Oh my dear lady of light, I recite that he went to go and get water. That is not the greatest tragedy. Oh lady of light, I recited the tradition that his arms were cut off. That is not the greatest tragedy of my son Abbas. What is the greatest tragedy of Abbas? That when he fell from the horse, there were no arms to protect his fall. Those arrows that were embedded into his stomach, those arrows that were embedded into his chest, that arrow that embedded it into his eye. What means did he have to protect his fall? At that point, when Abbas passes away from this world, Hussein lets out a huge cry. Wa Abbasa! Wa Abbasa! Oh Abbas, you have left me! Abbas, you have left me! A tradition says that this was such, such a difficult moment, such a cry for from Hussein, that even the enemy tyrants began to cry. They begin to cry and cry and cry. Hussein stood up and so said, Oh, enemies of Allah, now do you cry for me? Why do you cry when you have already slaughtered all of my friends and family? Why do you cry when you have cut off the arms of Abbas? At this point, Shimr bin Diljoshin begins to smile. He begins to laugh. He begins to smile. He says, Now that Abbas Abbas has been killed. There is no escape for Hussein ibn Ali. In these final moments, in these final moments, what was said between Abbas and Hussein? Hussein begins to cry. Abbas begins to cry. He asks, why are you crying so much? He says, oh my master Hussein, I am crying because right now, in my, my head is in your lap. But in a few minutes, your head will be in the lap of Shimr bin Diljoshim. In a few minutes after 
that your head will be placed upon a spear. How can I not cry when I am in this situation? The body of Abu Fadl Abbas is left where it is. He does not bring the body back towards the tents. Hussein stands up and slowly walks back towards the tents. Sakina! Sakina runs out to greet Abu Abdullah. Oh my father, where is Abbas? What news of my uncle Abbas? Where is the water that he has promised? Oh sweet child! Oh my dear daughter, Abbas has been slaughtered on the plains of Karbala. His arms lie by the river Euphrates. He is now in heaven with wings being granted to him. Oh Sakina, bear patiently. Bear patiently and tell the other children to bear patiently. At this point, when Zain al Abidin comes to bury, comes to bury all of the family members, and Banu Asad come towards Zain al Abidin and they say, We have helped you to bury all the family members, but there is one person who refuses to get up. There is one body that refuses to come to the others. Every time we pick up his chest, his feet stick to the ground. Every time we lift him from his feet, his chest stick to the ground. Zainul Abidin says, This is my uncle Abbas. His last wish will always be kept. He cannot be buried with the others. He does not go to them. I, Zainul Abidin, will go and bury the body of Abu Fadl Abbas. Allah, Allah, not Allah, you are the Omi Dalami, was I Adam Muladin, and Adamu, a human colleague, and Kalibun, and Nadilla, when Nailahi Rajaun, Matame Hussein, Yah Hussein.